So, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time introducing. I think pretty much everyone here knows what One Health is, right? So, One Health is, is certainly this connection between environment, between animals, between people, and that we need to approach problems in a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, and so this was intended to be the culminating event for our One Health this year. We've had, actually at this point, we have had 13 or so events in this year for One Health. And I'm so happy that many of you have been here for pretty much all of them. Uh, and I hope that for those who are graduating, that you, if you're in the area, you'll come back. Uh, we will be filming events and hopefully you will watch them online if you are not able to come back but we'd love to see you come back and help us grow one health uh, at this point i would like to introduce our guest tonight peter hudson he is currently at penn state university but uh, not too long ago he was in the himalayas uh, and in Sri Lanka and india and he has some great uh, photos to be showing you hopefully you'll be able to see them uh, and I think he's going to be a great way of ending up our, our year of One Health so please join me in welcoming him thank you very much indeed Reg that was very kind of you can you hear me okay with this if you can't hear me you go ah I don't know what you can do if you can't hear me <laughs> at least and I'm not sure if you, what to do if you can't see my screen. Um, as Reg said, what I'm going to talk about is One Health. I'm very much a wildlife disease person. I started wildlife management. I got involved in wildlife diseases. And more recently, I've been looking at the interconnection between wildlife, wildlife conservation, and also aspects of spillover, where viruses come from one, uh, one species and invade humans. I'm going to talk quite a bit about that. But there is this whole concept about One Health, and I think it's something like uh, global peace. It's something that's very obvious, and it's something that should happen. But one of the things I really want to see is I want to see some science in this area and some fundamental science which is going to happen. And if we do, I think it could be very important to our planet, to the future of our planet, and indeed to our own health. You obviously know about One Health, so I don't need to describe it anymore. So uh, my talk is going to fall into like four sections. I'm going to start off and I'm going to talk about the issue. I'm going to talk about One Health and I'm going to talk then about global health security. This is the movement basically of pathogens from one continent or one country to another. And then I'm going to talk about um, other components of this, and a, a passion, another passion of mine, which is actually photography, and how we can use photography to try and help change people's minds. So I, I'm going to talk quite broadly here. But I'm going to start off by asking you this question. What is the one thing, what is the fundamental issue facing our planet? What is the one thing that if we could change, we could help rectify some of the many problems and many of the, the many issues, and there are 20, I think it is, uh, millennial issues that we have in front of us that we're trying to solve. But what is the one thing we could do? To my mind, it's to try and stop human population growth. The world population at the moment will pass something like 7.8 billion this weekend, or in the next week or so, but it's rapidly approaching 10 billion people. The year I was born, there were 2.6 billion people. And I'm not that old, but I've been around uh, for a while. But that's quite frightening that the population has increased since then by 300, 200%. Quite a rapid increase. And that change in the size of the human population, of course, is going to have a very big impact you know, on our planet. And much of what I'm going to talk about relates to that. So you may not be able to see this, but this is actually a video about the proportion of people living in different parts of the world. So back in the 60s and 70s, most people lived in Asia, in India and China. But the thing, a point I want to get across, is how the proportion of people 
are changing very much in Africa. So you can see as we approach 2100, certainly your children will be alive at that time. The whole situation will have changed and we will have seen a massive shift with a high increase in the size of the population in, uh, in, in Africa. I think many of the places, many of the problems we're facing are coming out of Africa. That includes the diseases, that includes some of the wildlife issues, terrible problems with elephant poaching, lion populations declining, being wiped out, etc., etc. Um, and who are we to talk? After all, if you look at the Western world, what have we done to our wildlife populations? What have we done to our agriculture and the mess we've left there? So I'm going to, I want to sort of touch on some of these, some of these issues. If you can see this, this is the um, reproductive rate, the number of children and women in 1970. And again, we have this down here for 2014. The colors are such that the more red or orange they are, the greater the average uh, family size. Back in the 1970s, you can see there's quite a lot of orange and red throughout, not surprisingly, Asia and India. But in the past, uh, in the subsequent to that, we've seen a rather rapid decline. And uh, so we can see the population, so, so we can actually see that number of children being produced per female has actually fallen quite dramatically. Indeed, it's fallen in every country except for two. I think you'd be surprised to hear which two countries have not reduced their reproductive rate. The first is France, and the second is the United States. If you look at every other country, so the bluer it is, the fewer children there are. So if you have a very dark blue area, your reproductive rate has fallen. You can see the places like Canada and Brazil, huge drop in numbers, and of course, once again, in Asia, there's been a decline. In most of Africa, there has been a decline, but still in America and, and in France, it remains the same as it was back in the 1970s. This is not to say that we're contributing hugely to the population increases, because if you look here at Nigeria, the average, the average number of uh, children per woman is still six, and that's much higher than we are. We are still over two, but we're less than two in. So one of the consequences of this is people are moving into cities. What's really staggering is the urban growth rate that is actually taking place. So we're seeing more and more people shifting into cities. Can you see these slides at all? Sort of. I'll try and, tell, I'll try and pick up the stadium points. So if you look at Lagos, there are 85 people entering Lagos in Nigeria per hour. That's the net immigration rate. Delhi, it's 79. And Reg said I was there two weeks ago in Delhi, and it's huge numbers of people. People sleeping on the street is obvious, but I was, uh, I was amazed to see how many people are actually sleeping in, on the freeway, between the two freeways. It's just solid with people sleeping. Um, Dhaka, 78, Mumbai, 51. I mean, those are high rates of... Uh, people moving in. If you look at Tokyo, it's actually negative. London, it's plus nine. So they're quite in comparison. New York, plus 10. So it varies between cities. But of course, they're coming into these cities where we're seeing the population growth rate take place. One of the big consequences of this for the future, and indeed for your career and your lifetime, you're going to see major issues in food security. How do we get the food to these people? How are we going to make sure we get it to them while it's um, fresh? and while it's safe. Huge issues with, uh, did I say food security? I think that probably said, uh, I couldn't see it, energy security. So how do we get the power to them? How do we get their food to them? And how are we going to look after the environmental security? There's a lot of waste, huge amounts of waste, and it's quite astonishing when you go to some of these cities. Uh, um, and I, more rec actually, more recently, I was shocked in Ecuador more than anywhere about the huge amounts of garbage that are just lying about the place and on fire on the side of the road. But then when I was in Rwanda, I was stunned to discover that plastic bags and plastic bottles are illegal. So as you come in through the airport, they say, have you got any plastic bags? And you say, yes, and they go, give them to us and throw it away. No plastic bottles in this country at all. What a fantastic movement. So when you go through Rwanda, the country is beautifully clean. 
And one day every month, everybody goes out and cleans the countryside around their village. Tanzania, in contrast, we go over a, a bridge, over a river, it is solid with plastic water bottles as far as you can see. I have no idea where the river is. It's probably 20, 40 foot down, but the whole thing is just nothing but plastic bottles. This, this environmental security includes very much habitat destruction. And you must never forget the extent of habitat destruction. And this is the major problem that the increasing number of people are having in this world is the rate at which we're destroying habitat. Some of it pointless, some of it for agriculture, but of course we're 7.8 million, billion, sorry, heading towards 10 billion. Much more competition for uh, land resources. So uh, forestry, uh, tropical rainforests, are disappearing at the rate of 15 square kilometers uh, every minute. That's a huge amount of rainforest. Huge amount of wildlife we're losing as a consequence of that. Uh, this is a photograph I took in Nairobi uh, last year, which actually shows a lioness. And in the background is Nairobi itself. And it's, about, and it's trying to illustrate fragmentation, how building cities are fragmenting our habitat, the way we're setting up agriculture is fragmenting our habitat. And I think you... This is my first time to your university, first time really into this corner of Pennsylvania. And it's quite, it's a, it's a beautiful part of, the, part of the state, but it's also clear that there's huge fragmentation issues all over the place. And if you're wildlife and you need, if you're a bear or a deer or whatever, how do you move from one location to another? Usually through people's back, backyards, as far as I can say. And then there are these few ri rivers, very pretty and things, but they, they're moving through those areas as well. But it's important to realize that fragmentation is important. Last November, the World Wildlife Fund produced a report called the Living Planet Report in November, and they said 60% of the wildlife in the world has declined since 1970. That's the average rate basically, at how vertebrate populations have fallen. The average, we've got 60% less than we had back in the 1970s. All species. Some species, I mean, white-tailed deer, have probably gone up. And then other species, and lions and elephants, tigers, have clearly come down quite substantially. That is a really worrying statistic. Um, 60% of your closest relatives, the primates, are facing imminent extinction. And this is a photograph of a um, female gorilla that I took when I was in Rwanda with her baby in her arms, just looking at me. And, it, and this is one of the great success stories in conservation. Because of Diane Fossey and because of what we did to look after the gorillas, the population has come up, but it's still in a very fragmented habitat. But 60% of your closest relatives actually face imminent extinction. And that's, I think, very worrying. Very worrying indeed. Some species, and this is a remarkable photograph taken by a, a photographer I've never met, but it's a photograph of a leopard moving through the back streets of Mumbai. And these leopards have adapted to living in cities, and they feed mostly on dogs on stray dogs or people's pets that are left out. And you may have seen those wonderful photographs in the BBC Living World series where they were actually able to use um, heat-seeking cameras and, follow and show leopards moving through the city and then people walking straight past them as if they weren't there. The leopards just disappear into the background and then they come out and, as I said, they, live up, they love dogs. Love dogs to eat, I mean. So we've seen this terrible habitat destruction taking place. We've seen this huge fragmentation, and that's just increased our contact between humans and wildlife. There's much stronger contact between us. And because of that, we're pro we are exposed to a number of infections. So there are meant to be 1,405 infections. I mean, that's an estimate, so there could be 1,420. And 58% of those are derived from wildlife. 
And there are obvious ones there, aren't there? There are things like HIV. HIV, we know, came from chimpanzees in West Africa. Similarly, an immunodeficiency virus. It's got into the human population. In fact, we think it's got into the human population multiple times and then disappeared or faded out. And it was back in the 1920s the first initial infection took place. But of course, it wasn't until the 70s that it really got into the Western world and then it spread through San Francisco and Los Angeles and then moved right around the world and caused the global pandemic that we've seen. And for people of my generation, a devastating, devastating impact on human behavior and uh, human suffering as a consequence of that. I'm not trying to blame wildlife, of course, but I'm just trying to say that most of our infections come to them, and indeed most of their infections come from people like us. So it's going backwards and forwards all the time. So there is this sort of interconnection. And if you look around the world and you see the emergence of zoonotic infections, zoonotic infections, uh, infections that have come from animals, then you can see this has happened throughout the world. Hooray! You are a gentleman. <laughs> Don't move. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. That's greatly appreciated. I'm going to talk a little... No, no! <laughs> I'm going to talk a bit about heterovirus in a minute. But you know, things like Ebola, yellow fever, brucellosis, uh, SARS, oh, of course, Western Nile over here, dengue. These are Zika virus, all originated from wildlife and then spilt over into the human population. What I think is worrying is the rate at which these emerging diseases are now being, becoming global. And people don't talk enough about this. So if you look at what happened, it took HIV 56 years to get from Africa into the United States. I've already told you that. Ebola in 2014 took less than four months to get from West Africa into the United States. And that's quite clearly because we move around a lot. We take airplanes, we global connections. I mean, the fact that I was in India two weeks ago, and in a week's time, I will be 80 kilometers from the North Pole. Now, that's pretty easy for me to transport infections from Sri Lanka or from the Himalayas and, and expose either you or polar bears next week. So it's it is really amazing how fast these infections can take. I think the incredible thing is that when we identify a new resistant form of antimicro antimicrobial resistant bacteria, as soon as we see it, we discover it is actually here. So there are cases of, gosh, there's this outbreak of antimicrobial resistant bacteria in central India, and we say, well, have we got it? Yes, we have. So it appears to be instantaneous that things are actually being spread around. That's quite easy because you know, if I'd picked up an infection and taken some drugs uh, to try and clear my infection, I could easily be transmitting that if I got here. Uh, I, I don't think I have, but you ought to be careful getting close to me. What we're talking about here are global security issues. Uh, the, the fact that we want to defend ourselves against the next Ebola outbreak, but we also want to be able to help the people in the country who are suffering from it, and we want to give them the capability to do that. So I think very strongly that global health security is all about developing research and doing in-country capability, and I, I will come back to that again in a minute. And i am just used the Ebola as a classic example. It was a really a case where everything went wrong. The advisors of the United States were telling these countries, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and places like that, and saying, don't worry about it, it'll burn out, it'll go. They were totally wrong. This disease went spatial. And I think the other reason why we never gave the right advice is because these are Francophone countries, and Francophone countries do not really, uh, we're not very good at French. I wouldn't be surprised if I was the only person in the audience who could speak French, but I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But that, because of that, there was a lack of communication. And once it, here's another fact that you know, One Health is about interdisciplinary issues. It's about everything being interdisciplinary, which means you need people who can speak 
these languages. You need people who can communicate. You can need people who are going to be able to change the behavior of others. Personally, I think the science and the biology is relatively simple compared to some of these problems. And that, uh, that would hold true for conservation as well, I think. Did I go to work on and, and say, and Rich, put it there, you know, healthy people, healthy environment, healthy m m animals, are they all connected? Is this just wishful thinking, or are there, is there really good evidence and good science to do that? So I'm going to try and illustrate that with a case study. I'm going to look at Hendra virus in Australia, where I've been working on for about 10 years, and I, have a, I had a postdoctoral um, research student who is now uh, faculty at Montana State, and she's the person who's really leading this. I like to get involved with subjects and then pass them over to my students or postdocs, and then they make their career on it, and then I go off and do something more interesting. That's how I see it, anyway. So let me introduce you to this guy. This is Vic Rails. Vic Rails was a horse uh, trainer. Horse racing in Australia, and particularly down the east side of Australia, is a, a very important part of their society. They all go to the horse races. It's a very big thing, and many people have horses in their backyard. People have many horses that they own, and then they go to the races and they bet on them. And it's part, very much part of society. So there's it's much bigger there than it is here, and, all, and it's pretty big in the United Kingdom as well. Well, Vic is very famous because he uh, trained this horse, which is Beau Rogue. And Beau Rogue won one of the big cups, and very famous. Made a lot of money for Vic and, some, and the owner. And one day, Vic came back from the races, and he went into the field where he kept his horses, and there was a mare there that was frothing at the mouth. It was showing some serious... Uh, neurodegenerative behavior, tongue was hanging out, it had a fever. So he brought it into, this, into, the, um, into the stable and he phoned the local vet. The local vet was taking the evening off and the phone call went through to a very good friend of mine called Peter Reed. And Peter went round there to have a look at what was taking place. Quite soon after that, the um, stable hand became sick uh, Vic himself became sick uh, and went on and there were uh, 21 of those horses were involved, 14 of them died. Vic himself died from the infection, but the stable hand recovered. There's a case fatality rate of 57%, which means if you get it, you've got a 57, you've got a 43% chance of surviving it. So 57% percent of the people who've got it have died. You think of that compared to something like influenza. Influenza is something like 0.01 percent. Ebola is about the same. Ebola is about 57. Rabies is up in the 90s, because if you get it, you're dead. You know, rabies is going to kill you, but um, the likelihood of you getting it means you have to be bitten by a dog or a raccoon, and you have to be very unlucky to get it. But it's... Um, that's a very high case fatality rate, much higher than most of the human infections you think about. And so what Peter did was that he then, he had this job of carving up all these horses, pulling out their livers and guts, and basically putting them in bin liners and sending them back to the lab to try and see what it was this horse had died of. They called it Hendra virus because the place Hendra, uh, where um, Vic had his stables, it's right next to Brisbane Airport. And if you ever go to Brisbane, you, you drive out, and it, the first sign says, this way to Hendra. I always laugh, because it just seems, from all that way to Australia, and the first thing you see is the type of first, um, as the name of a virus, because viruses are always named after the place they came from. Except for sin nombre virus, which means virus with no name, because the village that got, first got it said, we don't want our village to become known. Anyway, so Peter then tried to find where the resource, where had this virus come from? And he and a, a colleague called Hugh Fields then did a large amount of work and couldn't find it at all. And then Peter was running a meeting for the horse owners and, and said, I've looked everywhere, I can't find it. I've looked in earthworms, I've done this, I've got, I've got birds, and there's this and every mammal, we've sampled everything there. Somebody stood up and said, what about the bats? And he goes, what about the bats? 
He said, well, just at dusk every day, there's this, these huge numbers of bats have been going over Vic's property. Have you sampled them? So he went out and sampled them, and sure enough, discovered the bats. Um, particularly these ones, the uh, black flying foxes, as well as the grey-headed flying foxes, were also, were also transmitting it. And in fact, we also found it in other species. And this is a map of eastern Australia, of course. Every one of these points is where there's been an outbreak. And this is where Brisbane sits, and where, by far and away, the majority of the infections have occurred. And they tend to occur in the winter months. And we've been able to show there's been a substantial change in the behavior of the bats during this time period. And this is just a map of Brisbane. Um, but if I've got this data in the next slide, I can show this for most of Australia. These bats used to live in very big camps. So here's the city. But they lived inside the city in these huge, huge camps with hundreds, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of bats. The one big change in the behavior is now the bats are divided up into many, many more, but smaller colonies uh, across the place, across the area. And what we've been able to show is the bats are starving during the winter months. And they're starving during the winter months because they can't get access to the, to the nectar from the eucalyptus trees. And that's because we've cut them all down. There's almost, very, there's almost no habitat remaining for it. This is what all feeding habitat in eastern Australia looks like. The reliable winter feeding habitat is really difficult, and then the, the amount of protected habitat is almost impossible, such that when you get an El Nino event, so that's the southern oscillation where the, where the weather changes and it becomes really wet and miserable, then the remaining bit of eucalyptus does not flower, the bats are starving, and our hypothesis is that when the bats are starving, they go to other food resources, and they're in poor condition, and they're starting to start, and, and they start shedding virus. So this is a virus that involves domestic livestock, the horses. It involves coming from a wildlife resource, the bats. And this is a virus that not only kills the horses, but also keys, kills people. And it's because of environmental degradation. And that's the removal of the prime habitat for the, for the flying foxes. So this is, I believe, a good example of One Health. And there's also a good example of spillover, which is the way things have changed and how there is a cascade taking place. So we looked at bats distribution, and the bats distribution changes, uh, and the winter foraging has been destroyed by agriculture. And Nina comes in, it leads to no flowering, bats get short of food, and so they start to use small temporary camps. The bats then start to shed the virus. This virus survival is good in these, in these weather conditions. The horses are exposed, and the horses at that time of year are on a low plane of nutrition, so they're susceptible to the infection. And if the bats are feeding on fruit, say on figs, what they'll do is they'll feed on the, on the figs and then spit them out, and the horses come round and sniff up what of fruit are left to eat them themselves, and so they become infected, and that they and the people subsequently die. Solutions to this? Well, everybody wants a vaccine. Everybody thinks a vaccine is the answer to everything, and um, some of my colleagues develop quite quickly, because developing a vaccine isn't difficult. You can do it, but to get it through all the regulations is often difficult, but they developed a horse vaccine, and you can vaccinate the horses, but it only lasts a year. And it costs 300 Australian dollars, which is less than ours, but it's still a lot of money for horse. Some of these people have 20, 30, 50, 100 horses. No way they're going to do it. And so they do their own risk assessment, and they say, well, I've got some very valuable horses here that I use for racing. I'm going to vaccinate those. Other people say, I've never seen a bat on my property so I will not vaccinate my horse. And that's where the problem lies. If you don't vaccinate your horses and you live in a place where you never see bats, it's when the bats come to those places. And I've visited lots of infections, infected premises, where you see um, the person say, it was a terrible weather, that, you know, and then suddenly we saw these bats 
the weather was so bad, I brought the horses in closer to the house so I didn't have to trudge through the mud. And then all this, and the, the, our fruit trees were in fruit, and they infected the horses. So horse vaccine isn't working. What I would like to see is re-establishing the, the vegetation. I would like us to do some rewilding, planting trees for human health. And we've got a lot of interest in this. There's a lot of Australian landowners who are interested in allowing us to do some rewilding. It's pretty big in Australia, rewilding, because the Australasian, the Australian fauna has been decimated. And so they're very keen to try and do something there. But to actually put this back to help the health of the bats and to help human health as well. So I think that example showed you that everything is connected. I think it shows you that the health of humans, livestock, wildlife, and the environment are connected. And I think the spillover process, where it comes all those different layers of that cascade, is the fundamental basis of what can become the science of spillover and the science of One Health. And so we're developing the mathematics of that to try and understand that and more. And so give us some theory, because if I believe if you have theory, then you can test it you have theory allows us to make predictions and that's that's what science is basically about. I think it's important that it can be generalized as well and I think it generalizes quite well for things like Ebola. So the Ebola outbreak, and I don't know this, but my, one hypothesis, and my, it's my hypothesis, is that we cut down the, we cut down the forest in places like Guinea we put down a lot of palm oil plantations. The bats then are living all in the, all in the villages, and that's when the kids got infected that started the initial Ebola outbreak. So I think it's important to, um, to do the science and then be able to apply it. Working on Ebola in Africa, working in West Africa, people say to me, come and work out in Eastern DRC, and I go, I've done it, I'm not going. I really don't want to live in squalor weeks are on end and I really and I don't want to put I'm not sending any of my students out there because it's warfare and it is at times dreadful. I'll think about it after so the third thing I want to talk about is this whole thing about global health security. And I've I've talked a little bit about it. I talked about it's security from invasive infection. And it's also about improving security awareness, particularly in the low-income countries. And I think we can do that using research and education. And health, that's the job of universities. That's what we do. I do research and education. That's what my university does. That's what this university does. So that's what we should be thinking about. But let's go right back to the beginning. The first challenge I gave you was to say, what, what do you think about the biggest problem facing this world? And you very kind, and I very kindly, <laughs> I, I told you that I thought it was because of the human population. So what thing, one thing, could we try and do to try and stop the world population increasing at the rate it is at the moment? What is the one thing that we could try and perhaps influence, given that we're involved in research and education? What's the one thing that will be the best thing for us to try and do? I think it's very obvious. And it's beautifully illustrated by this lady, Malala. Malala, of course, took a bullet just under her left eye for standing up for women's, the education of women. She was a Pashtun, and she, um, she was involved in, in making sure that her colleagues she was only a child, but she was involved in educating women in her country. And it's been shown by United Nations and UNESCO that if you improve the education of women, and the further you improve the edu education of women, you give them more opportunities, that it reduces the birth rate because it reduces child mortality, it reduces maternal mortality, it improves child nutrition, so women take control more of their bodies and when they do that, as opposed to women who aren't educated, they have fewer children and so the birth rate starts to fall because they know 
that I'm going to get this one or two children through, and they're going to survive. I don't have to have, I don't have to have 10, 15 children to try and make sure that one or two of my children survive. When you do that, improve education, they show that it improves awareness and understanding of infectious disease problems. Of course it improves the quality, because that's what we're talking about. It improves economic growth. It improves the innovation of land and water, such that we improve fresh water, the use of the land, and uh, women, women that have been involved in the land can actually uh, influence what's actually taking place. So much so that it changes resilience to climate change. Not only because you're changing the population uh, that are being educated, but because, and it's also because they are more attuned to that. Leading to further peace and tolerance. And it just seems to me such an obvious thing and something that me as a simple professor should be doing something about to try and help them. I was greatly influenced by Nelson Mandela and Mandela has always said that education is the most powerful weapon to change the world. And I think he's totally right. I think that's a really important thing, that we should reach out and educate as much, much of the... And through that, stop this intolerance that we see in the world. And I'm just on a soapbox here, but intolerance to gender, intolerance to race, intolerance to... Oh, so many things. And I mean, much of the warfare and problems we have in the world are all around different levels of intolerance. And of course, what I want to do at the end is to build this research capability, and um, particularly educating women. And it was more than 10 years ago, it must have been something like 15 years ago, before Mandela died, he tried to set up a series of universities in Africa, called the Nelson Mandela African Institutes of Science and Technology. The one doing life science, and I'm a life scientist, talking in the life science building here, the life science one was done in Arusha in Tanzania, and I've become involved. I'm very proud of the fact that I run their scientific advisory committee, I'm a professor there, and I, I um, regularly go there two or three times a year. So how do we do this education? Well, education, of course, involves a whole arsenal of techniques. It involves things, people giving lectures, reading textbooks, having discussion groups. But now we have this opportunity to develop these massive open online courses. And my colleagues and I set up this one just trying to explain how epidemics work. And it's run by Coursera. And we've had more than 100,000 students involved in this course. Currently, there are 31,000 involved. They come from every continent. If I was to teach a class of 500 students every semester, then it would take me, maths is something like 50 years to reach that number of students. And yet, these short videos that we've done, we've been able to reach a huge number of people from these MOOCs. And it's, I think it's I think it's just an illustration of one way you can actually do this. The other thing we've done is got heavily involved with the Nelson Mandela African Institute of Science and Technology. We've built five new labs out there, and uh, we have our BL2 lab that we've developed as the, as the regional expertise in anthrax. We try and stop our anthrax outbreaks reaching this country. Can we stop them in that country? And we stopped, we believe we stopped. It's very difficult to prove a negative, isn't it? I can't prove that I did stop an outbreak last year, but I believe that my students and staff there stopped three outbreaks last year. We've trained 20 women PhD scientists, and they have, most of them have gone on to other jobs in academia and different parts of Africa. And somebody said to me, you know, 20 women in Africa, Pete, that's trivial. That's nothing. And my answer to that was, what the hell? I'm giving it my best shot. And you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't a person in this audience who read one of my scientific papers. I don't blame you. I wouldn't read them if I were you. But, <laughs> you're an idiot. <laughs> See, I have to bring Richard up. But I mean, but you know, this, mu um, this might be a better legacy of mine than all the science that I've actually done. We're working in India as well. We're heavily involved in trying to control uh, bovine tuberculosis there. 
you can't eliminate bovine tuberculosis without, you can't eliminate human tuberculosis without elim eliminating bovine tuberculosis, and we can't go and kill infected animals because they're all sick. So my colleague has developed a new vaccine and a new way of rolling this out, and we're struggling, but we're getting there bit by bit, and we're trying to uh, reduce that. Of course, reducing the disease and helping people to reduce the disease, I hope, will lead to reduced birth rates as well. I'm getting more and more involved in what's taking place in Panama. Most people that come into this country, for, that uh, come into this country and don't come from Mexico, uh, Guatemala, or Nicaragua, tend to come up through Ecuador because they don't need. Um, they can get into Brazil, get to Ecuador without a visa. You can then get a bus up through Colombia, and you're taken to this point, and then you're basically told you have to walk 80 kilometers through this very serious rainforest. I mean, it's very steep. I spent four months there. It's a pretty awful place to be. But during this time, they get infections, and they get abused. And when they come out the other side to the place called Matesi, which is just... Uh, which is just on the other side of the border. Then we, we developed a clinic where we're trying to look after these people and trying to treat them, the displaced migrating people. I can talk more about that later. I'm involved in trying to get serious funding for that. Okay, so that's the one health bit. What I want to do now is I want to think, how can we change the behavior of people? And I think this is a very important thing to do. It's very easy for me to do my science, and it's very easy for you to say, oh, he developed a vaccine, he did this, he solved that problem, he developed this, this form of reducing infection in wildlife like this, and, and, then, and uh, I think our work has saved the bighorn sheep, and uh, we think we're in the process of saving the desert tortoise, but that's okay, you can all go home. We said, but how can we actually change the minds of people so they see things in a different way. Well, I'm interested in how we can use photography and videos to do this. And so uh, I thought I'd ask you the question, what are the most impact photo impactful photographs you've ever seen? Let me show you the two that were the most impactful from my point of view. You may never have seen these before, but I think these two photographs changed the world. The first one is the napalm girl. Which, took, which was a photograph taken place in 1972 that was published in Life magazine. At that point, I, I was 18 years old. No, I wasn't, I was 19 years old. But I remember this photograph coming out. And this is Kim Fook, and she's just run out of her village, which the Americans have just told the South Vietnamese to bomb with napalm. This girl has had all her clothes and a large amount of her skin burnt from her body from the napalm attack. Her brother, I'm not sure if this is her brother. No, her brother was a baby. He was in somebody's arms just outside this photograph. But he was also in this terrible situation. I think both of her parents were killed during this attack. But this one photograph had a huge influence on the Vietnam, Vietnam War. Because of this, there was a mass sea change in the way Americans saw the war and had an appreciation of they were involved in atrocities as well and in this tragic situation. And within a year of this photograph being taken, the Americans pulled out of Vietnam, started the pullout of Vietnam, and so stopped the war stop. She went on and had surgery. She, uh, the Vietnamese kept her in Vietnam. Then she managed to get permission to go to Cuba to get treated in Cuba, where she met her uh, then her, the man who then became her husband, and they then both escaped from there, and they now live in Canada as Canadian citizens, and a fairly successful life in this terrifying ordeal that they went through. The second photograph, I expect most of you have seen this, is the Afghan girl by Steve McCurry. Steve McCurry took this photograph. He was standing in a, um, he was sitting in a refugee camp entrance, and this girl walked in, and she just turned around and looked at him, and he took the photograph. And those piercing eyes, the fact that the uh, eyes are the same color as the background of the wall, 
the way she's looking at you just takes your breath away. It really was just a snap. It's not a setup. It hasn't changed the color of the eyes or anything. This is Shabak Gula, who at that stage is 12 years old. I find that really difficult to look into that face and say, that girl is just 12 years old because she seems in her face to have had such an ordeal in her life. She's had a tragic time since then. She uh, married a different men. She's been seriously abused. And I think she's currently in prison. In at the moment. So she's had a real change. But the consequence of this, of this photograph is that it was used by George um, Bush to um, try and illustrate the abuse of women in that part of the world and was used to try and change the way things were. And it certainly was involved in the and the change in the way the Americans were um, active in Afghanistan and places at that time. So I think these have been very impactful photos. I think in One Health, and particularly in conservation, I'm going to move more into the wildlife conservation side, I think we should also be using photographs and I believe you know, short videos that you could see on YouTube or other social media. I can't believe it. When you're in India, everybody's on their phone all the time. Some of them have two phones and different systems. In Africa, people have three phones. But the social media is huge in Africa. You can't believe, in India, you can't believe how they're, they're on Instagram continuously. It's uh, astonishing to me. I mean, it's pretty bad in this country, but it's nothing compared to what it is in India. And it's really catching on in Africa. So if you want to change people's behavior, I think it has to come through social media. So, I'm good, so here's a photograph. That I'm, you know I'm involved in bats. I'm involved in bat research. I'm involved in trying to understand it. I'm trying to illustrate this. So uh, this is a photograph, obviously, of a, of a long-tailed bat coming in to pollinate a flower. Um, and to m my mind, it's starting to tell you a story. It's telling you that this animal is very dependent on the nectar being produced by this, uh, by this plant. And when, as it's doing it, it's covering itself, and here are bits of pollen spurting out. I think there are other components of its behavior that you might not know about that you can illustrate. Such that, did you know bats, you know, when they want to drink, they actually scoop down and scoop water up straight into their face. So these have to be photographed. And taking photographs is easy, because you can do it with your, and you know, your iPhone is one of the best ways you can take photographs. If it wasn't taken with an iPhone. <laughs> but it, the whole point being that, you, that um, people are taking photographs and using them on Instagram. But you have to have photographs that are going to make people stop as they're going along. It's even better when they involve people. And this is a health carer who's been rearing this, um, uh, one of the bats we work on, the black flying fox. They're huge, aren't they? And uh, looked after it when it was suffering and then um, got it through and then she's actually in the process of releasing it back into the colony. And here's another one, another one that he, she was actually feeding a baby that had fallen out of the tree and looking after. In Australia, there's a huge number of these um, people actually looking after the, um, looking after damaged bats. And I think if you have people and animals, it tells you almost more than the biology does. As I said, and sometimes it's a pretty complex setup. So I'm using a camera here. You can see the flowers there. And we're trying to get the bat right into the lens. That, and you can see the bats come in, just slurping away in the neck there. But I'm using, a couple of, uh, I'm using a couple of flashes, and I'm using this infrared trigger to try and take that photograph. So it's not necessarily an easy thing. This is another one I took. And this is a part of a series of photographs I'm taking about awareness of wildlife and roads. And uh, I actually took this one close to Yellowstone. I do a lot of research in Yellowstone on the wolves population there. This is a coyote, it's not a wolf. And I saw those coyote coming along the road and the snow was about three foot deep. So I just lay in the gutter and this coyote just trotted straight up to me. Probably about two foot away when I took this photograph. And the whole idea was I was just praying that a car was going to come around the corner. And of course I couldn't get both in focus at the same time, but you get the feeling that there's a story in that photograph. Another one I took in Africa last year, and this is a mother that we'd watched hunting and catched a baby warthog and then brought it back to its, to its cubs, which are pretty grown. 
and they're jumping up to try and get it, but you can see the drama, and you can see, I hope, start to see some of the story. Then when I was in the Himalayas last week, I was fortunate enough to see snow leopards, which is one of the most elusive animals, just a beautiful one. And this is, this is about over a kilometer away. She was, came up over the top of the hill, and so I, was, uh, I set my camera up so there was no shake or anything. I was just trying to take this photograph, and as I took the photograph, I realized that her cubs were, she was calling her cubs, and her two cubs were just bouncing into the photograph. So I think, you know, this is a bit of a story. I'm very fortunate that they're on the skyline. To get that focus and to get no camera shake at that distance is almost impossible. But I, but I think I just managed to do it. And it's the fact that they're jumping in that makes the picture, I think. And so it, if it's a rare animal, I think you can get away with photographs that aren't so good. I think we need new angles to take photographs. And I took this one at Lake Magadi in southern Kenya last year, just before Christmas, from a helicopter. And these are elephants in an elephant grass. And so getting photographs from above or below gives you a new perspective on telling the story about elephants. And I go, and I've just been telling that story about elephants in a magazine I started in January. And it's called Paul's Trail to Wear. And, it's in and what I do is every other month I write a, a magazine and use uh, photography to illustrate it. And the one that just came out on May the 1st, which I believe was yesterday, uh, was about elephants. And it was about the elephant ivory trade and how science is helping to prosecute some of the ivory cartels. Um, so the whole idea is to try and to get, particularly people in the Middle East and in India. I would love you to go to our web website, and it's called pausetrails.com, sign on, because if you sign on, and I can show people that I've had X hundred thousand people come to our magazine, then we get more money for advertising, and that money I can assure you will not go into my pocket at all, but go into conservation pr uh, processing. But it's a free online magazine that tries to illustrate science and photography. And I'm trying to do this as a community photo project. So they're not my photographs. I will seed it with a couple of photographs. And then I ask photographers, particularly those in the Middle East and in India and Africa, give me your images so I can illustrate this. And they, they're proud when their images are... Um, are published and they can say, you know, I published my maggot, I published my photographs. They have to be really good photographs, but it also in helps to increase awareness because those, those people, I want them to tell other people to look at the magazine and I hope see the problems that we're having with say, ivory. We're doing a series of books as well. We've done a couple of books and we've got another book coming out. But once again, it's that's really just to try and increase awareness. The other thing that I really want to do, and I'm struggling a bit to do this at the moment, is I'm trying to set up a group called Girls Who Click in Muslim countries. So to get women more involved in conservation issues by either lending them cameras, giving them cameras, or getting them to bring their iPhones along to take photographs. So to do this, obviously I can't be in the room, ideally but not in the country because I'm a male, uh, but to get women photographers to teach these, to teach women how to take photographs, and particularly photographs of conservation and social issues. And through that process, I think we can reach out and have more of an impact on people. I've got a bit fast because we started late and I want, didn't want to go on for too long. But um, I only did a bit of this work. There's lots of other students and people in my lab who've done much, much of the bits of the science, and I want to take out Raina Farright in particular, Peggy Alba, just wonderful people, heavily involved in doing the, um, in doing the Hendra work. Um, so I'm going to stop there, and thank you very much. And if Reggie's up to running around, I'm very happy to take any questions. I wouldn't dare ask for the lights. But, uh, <laughs> now it doesn't matter. But. It'd probably take them an hour to get the lights. The lights, we could be in big trouble. Would anybody like to? Have you got the? Have you got the? Yeah. I have a mic. Have a mic, I have a mic and I grab it.
But I think you could almost shout. Is, I mean, is this working? Yes, that's working great. Thank you. Hello. Um, yeah. I just wanted to ask, with climate change, how do you think these infections and these diseases are going to change or progress with the within the next couple of years or over time? So the question was, how's climate change going to influence diseases and disease spread? Well, there are two components of that. One of those components is the movement of people and wildlife that are going to take the diseases with them, expose other people or animals to them, and so start an epidemic somewhere else. And we know that takes place. So we know that, for example, in the southern Sahel, that the movement of people has changed through climate change because they have to move away because there are, no, um, there are no resources in the Sahel Desert, so they must move away. And that, when they move away, and they start an epidemic. In exactly the same way, when animals move, or we translocate them, that can cause some di disease issues as well. So in many parts of the distribution of animals, they, they, we've seen a shift in the animal species, and we, the conservationists, will sometimes get up and move those uh, animals to see how they, uh, how they, um, how they to try and reestablish them in new places. And we must be careful about that. Not only, and we are careful, so when we move translocate animals, we invariably move them without, um, by making the animals clean when we move them. But we put them into places where they get infections from other animals and they can then suffer. And I, that's a lot of my research. I would say that's 80% of, 60% of what I do is actually on that very issue. Great question. You should have given the talk. Thank you. Um, yep. In terms of the, the bats in Australia and planting more trees, is, do you have a lot of issues with then human wildlife conflict? Because I know it's kind of a hot topic issue as to whether people want bats near yep. them or. There, there, there are huge human wildlife conflicts. One of the places that I visited recently, there was this bat colony right next to a, to a kindergarten school. And understandably, the parents and the teachers of the school are very concerned about it. And it's very difficult for me to actually say, I know you're worried because they're there, but those bats are fine because they're healthy. That's why they're there. It's when they turn up in places they shouldn't be, that's when they're going to cause the problem. So it's a very difficult thing to actually talk about. But the Australian government has said it is illegal to persecute bats. It's illegal. So people try to burn down their colonies. And some of the politicians get, some of their politicians are dreadful. I, mean, I think we do exceptionally well for dreadful politicians in the United States. But some of those are really dreadful as well. And they, um, and they sort of say, you know, blast them out of the sky, chainsaw the trees down, shoot them, firebomb them, and things like that. Uh, but the, I think through some of the things we're trying to do, starting to realize that if you do that, you're just moving the problem on to somewhere else. And this is not, this is considered an illegal thing to do anyway, so you can't go and do it. But the best thing is to be able, to, and I've been working very closely with a social scientist on this, and she's been teaching me a lot about how we can use narratives uh, to try and tell people the story about the bats, about the bat science, and try and do it in an non-emotive way them being able to answer these questions without it being emotional. Personally, I think science can do that. Um, I, I really get cross with scientists who say, well, we don't know because we haven't got enough data yet. I think you have to say, given the data we have, our understanding is this. These are things you shouldn't do, and these are things you should do. Um, but you know, those might shift as we get more data and insight. But I'm also, I was very fortunate that when I was four years old, my parents gave me a bird book. And I was a biologist from then onwards. 
None of my family are biologists, but you know, I just wanted to do nothing but biology from then onwards. And so when I do science, I go into the field and I watch these bats and I photograph them. And, and then after a while, I, I sort of understand what these animals are doing. Now I have to do the experiments and the observations to actually illustrate, to be able to convince my colleagues that I do know what I'm talking about. And that's what science does. And then it looks for those solutions from that. And from those insights, come forth those solutions. I, for, in, in Scotland, God's country, if you haven't realized that's where it comes from, Scotland, uh, we had a terrible disease in the grouse which caused immense problems and resulted in lots of income to people in the highlands. And I worked out that it was a disease. It was an infection with a nematode. And so I developed a pill that the grouse take Solved, solved that, an antimicrobial test. The trick was being able to, first of all, be able to leave this, which is actually pieces of grit on the map, because they won't take the pill. You see, you, see I, I could actually produce something which is the best food they could possibly want, put ice cream on top of it, and they'll stand on top of it and poop on it. But I could get them to take this pill eventually. And so being able to change and we're talking about relatively poor areas of Scotland, the economic structure and things like that. As a consequence of that, that came from insight. And you know, people go, oh, wow, that was fabulous, great science. And I go, yeah, but it was really just insight from understanding what goes on. So I think we can do it. And I'm very much an optimist on that. Long answer to a brilliant question. I should have said yes. So one of the emerging diseases in the zoo field is uh, elephant tuberculosis, and I was wondering if there's been any overlap with that, with your work with bovine tuberculosis. So I couldn't quite hear that. So I think you said elephant tuberculosis? Yes, yeah, so that's one of the emerging diseases that we see in the zoo field today. And in you had what? mentioned that you did work with bovine tuberculosis, and I know it's different strains, but I was wondering if there's been any overlap between the two. The I do know that some of these tuberculosis strains, I mean, human tuberculosis will get into elephants, and some of the other, elef and some of the other strains will get across. Um, we did some, did some work on that in Africa. I wasn't quite sure where you said, you're referring to where it was. Did you say where this? Oh, in the zoo. So we think some of the, that, so we know there's a lot of human tuberculosis that takes place we think those infections basically come from the mahouts or the zoo carers who put the kibbutz across them. Of course, they didn't connect as a reservoir. So I'm tuberculosis positive, but it's held in my lungs because it's a latent infection. So I think I picked it up in Botswana, and it sits there as a latent infection in my lungs. And until I'm immunosuppressed, it won't break out. But if I get cancer, or when I get cancer, and that's going to become a serious issue to deal with. Um, so there's a lot of infected animals, and when they're stressed, they then start to pass that infection on. Don't worry, you're not infectious. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> I can understand why you're not sitting in the front rows, guys. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming out here. It's been a very busy day here, so I'm very grateful you came out. Any other questions? With your travels um, and your, your work that you've done with One Health, probably from the traditional point of view, I love what you're doing with photographs because I really do think that photographs speak and they speak in people's own languages, whatever that might be, whether they're from a biological standpoint yeah. or whether they're more social sociology. Um, have you come across any culture that you felt really understood One Health, not necessarily as a concept of One Health, but the things that, the connectivity, have you found any place that you think has more of that? And do you have any idea why they might? So I'm trying to do a documentary on this. And um, so part of my travels, I'm interviewing people in different parts the world and um, I'm trying to see how um, ecotourism might be helping local health so for it so for instance it's really obvious if you go to Madagascar where the um, 
some of the research stations and places where tourists go to see lemurs um, that, that charge taxes to support the local villages and education and the health processes. And that works pretty nice in, um, in Madagascar. And but I was up in, when I was up in the Himalayas two weeks ago, we met this guy who had, uh, had all his goats killed by a snow leopard. So we interviewed him through a translator. He talks Ladakh. I only know a person who talks Ladakh. I don't know one word in Ladakh. And he's and we were just chatting, and we were and I was saying, you know, this. Um, tell me how you feel about losing your goat. This is your livelihood that's gone. This is tragic. And uh, and I said, how do you feel about the snow leopard? And he said. The snow leopard must live. If there was no snow leopards in the mountains, the mountains would be quiet. And it just took my breath away. Here he is, he's made a huge economic hit and everything. But he doesn't hate the snow leopard. And the Snow Leopard Conservation Trust uh, can, are just doing a fantastic job showing people how to mitigate those. And in fact, they, so they, they say, you know, this is, these are the ways you protect your goats from a snow leopard attack. And then they have an insurance system they've set up. What they do, it isn't a government-run insurance system. What they do is they give money to the local communities and say, if anybody suffers from snow leopard attack, you can use this money to mitigate it. So this person comes along and says, I lost 20 goats killed. So the snow leopard doesn't kill 20 goats. He gets into the corral where the goats are and, goes to, and the goats jump around on top of each other and kill each other. And then the snow leopard kills one and eats one, and then the guy comes in the morning, and all the goats are there. Because he's killed one, but all the others are panicked and just jumped on top of each other. So, but they give it to the community, and by giving the money to the community, the community knows that that person really did lose those animals. The community also knows if he's somebody that does a lot of, uh, I can't think of the right word in American other than the word bullshit, but, but you know, to, that's it. That's, but I mean, that's, they just, um, they, they know as the community. And they also know that if they give that money to him, for his goats, it's not going to be somebody available to somebody else. It's not going to be available for somebody else. So they have to decide how they divide that money up. And I think that's very much what conservation, what One Health is all about. It's about people having the responsibility, people being involved in that, in their own decisions. And it's a, it's a community. I think is, uh, is really important. I have to say that one of the things that I did not know before I moved to the US, and I moved 16 years ago, was I got involved with our local community hospital and our local community bank. And I'm stunned in America how that works. I'm really impressed. So our community hospital takes anybody that's sick, and they will, you know, they will work out the money and insurance issues afterwards. And in exactly the same way, the community bank uh, has special programs for single parent families and to help people buy their homes and do that. I just, uh, I just think that's really fabulous. And I'm talking to them about global community effects. I, I just think, and it's very nice when I go around the world and say, you know, even in America we do community things. This is what's happening in my backyard. So I, I don't know if I, I think I answered your question, but I tried to. We're trying to bring in the interdisciplinary side. I, I think you did a great job with my question. Thank yeah, you very much. I agree. Uh, uh, hi, hello, I have a comment and a question. I um, agree with Reg about the um, how, how brilliant it is that you're using photographs and getting out your information in that kind of a way that's appealing to people to sp spread the word of your research. Um, that's my comment. And then the question is, um, I saw a reference on one of your slides to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Can you oh, yeah. talk, tell us a little bit about um, where your funding sources are and if those things are in jeopardy with the current political climate, Gra things like that? Great question and a question I should have done. So Bill and Melinda Gates will not give you money for research or education. I want money for research and education. But what they have done is they gave us the first four million for those 20 students to investigate problems, uh, 
to fund women to look at um, uh, to uh, look at domestic livestock women's issues. So Newcastle disease virus was one. And amongst the Maasai, the female, the women actually own the cattle. So uh, I've done a, quite a lot of work on trypanosomes in the Maasai cattle because it's the women own the cattle. And so the, the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates allowed us to do that. So Melinda Gates is very keen on training women for the future. So that was very fortunate but it's got to be very direct and very impactful. We don't want to do education, really. We're trying to get them to do the next tranche of this, and they keep saying yes, no, yes, no, which is how it goes with these sorts. We have, so the uh, work on anthrax was funded by the Department of Threat Reductions, and they see that as a threat to this country, and anthrax is a, um, is a uh, listed infection that we're, they're particularly concerned about. But if I had um, Hendra's as well, but in fact Hendra is being run out of a DARPA grant at the moment, so we've got an 11 million DARPA grant to run that work, plus an NSF grant, which is you know, a program called Coupled Human Natural Systems. That gives us like 14, 15 million to do that. I think there is a lot of money that should come out of the defense side. So when you're involved in research and you become a PI, you spend much of your time writing grants to try and get money. And, you, and every professor in my university is very much a, an entrepreneur in their own right, because they do their own research. Yes, I earn my salary by teaching, um, but then to do my research, I need every penny from outside. I don't get the university doesn't give me money to do any of this, I have to get that money. And my trick is to do, to divide it up. So I get money from NIH, I get money from NSF, which are federal things, I get money from Bill and Melinda Gates, I get money from DARPA, and I, uh, but multi, and I get money from the Australian government, I get money, anywhere there's, there's money, I'll be there to get it. And, and the bigger the money, the harder I'm gonna try to, to actually get it. So I think you need to do multiple, multiple areas, but I think there's a huge amount of money that should come out of the global health security side. I thought, post Ebola, we were gonna see huge amounts of money come out from the defense side, because they're no longer worried about the real weapons of mass destruction being chemical warfare or biologically manipulated infections. These are advertent or inadvertent introductions of infections into this country. Obviously, Ebola was an inadvertent introduction. SARS got into Canada, but it didn't get into this country. Obviously, Western Nile was an inadvertent introduction. The spread of Lyme disease is a natural spread of that. But it would be so easy for somebody to take a lump of meat with foot and mouth and throw it out in Lancaster County, and we would have a devastating epidemic. So I think that's a health security issue because I think that affects the whole population. So I think the Department of Defense should be funding that. Obviously with this administration, it's not been as easy as I'd hoped it was going to be. And uh, this administration has disemboweled the CDC, they've disemboweled the pandemic committees that were, and those are the global disease issues. They uh, completely got rid of all of those. And the tragedy there is exactly the Ebola tragedy. The, what happened was, two years before the 2014 outbreak, the World Health Organization broke up their Ebola team. And because of that, the expertise had gone. There wasn't anybody there with knowledge and insight. And that's, that's what you actually need. You need, that's what I was saying to you, you need the naturalist who goes in and goes, I can't show it, but my gut feeling is this, this, and this. So I once, when I was working on grouse in Scotland, I went to a laird's, Laird's of the landowner, and the laird said, I've no grouse on the hill, Peter. I bet, I bet you can't find anything. And I looked at his hill and I said, if we're gonna find them, they'll be in that bit of vegetation over there. And I, I just put my dogs in there. Dogs went on point and flushed a brood of grouse. And I said, you've got grouse. Now let's see how you can get more grouse. And that, that was the, that was an intuition. And I think that intuition we mustn't lose that intuition with disease as well. 
I think we'll end it there. Uh, I invite all of you to come up and meet our speaker. Uh, and thank you so much, Peter, for a fantastic end to our year of One Health Seminars. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rich.